This is going to be Genesis chapter 35, and I'm going to talk about the subject of basic instructions before leaving empty-handed. You see, one of these days you're going to die, or you're going to go out of this world in a rapture if you're saved. And from the time that you got saved, you began to work, or you should have. You began to work at having something to present to Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, it's true that when it comes to your material possessions, things like that, you're not taking anything out of this world. But what you will take with you is things to present to Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. And a lot of Christians aren't doing this. And when the rapture happens, they not only leave behind all their material possessions, as we all do, but they also won't have any good works to take with them either. So here are some basic instructions before leaving empty-handed. As in instructions that you need to go by so that you don't leave empty-handed. The first one is go back to Bethel. In Genesis 35.1, that's exactly what Jacob is told to do. It says in Genesis 35.1, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, Go up to Bethel, and Bethel means house of God, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. So Bethel is where Jacob first got right with God. Remember, some chapters back, and it's where he saw the angels ascending and descending on the ladder, the ladder being a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when someone says it's time for you to go back to Bethel, they're referring to this here, and many times what they mean is that it's time to go back to where you first got right with the Lord. Think back to when you first got right with God. What were you doing at that time that made you love the Lord? For me, if, if I ever feel like I'm losing my first love, as it talks about in Revelation, I just go back to marking up my Bible. And I think about the first time that I got Bible, with wide margins in it, and began marking that thing up. Actually, it, it wasn't a wide margin Bible, but it had some pretty big, kind of bigger margins in it in the Ruckman Reference Bible. The first real Bible that I got, and I, I remember sitting in my room, marking that Bible up. And that's when I fell in love with the Bible. And I just go back to that. I mean, I don't really go back to it because that's what I do every day. I mean, every day I'm marking up my Bible as I've done for years and years. That's what I do every day. That's my Bethel. That's If I ever get to a point to where I feel like I'm losing my love for the Lord, most likely I've not been doing that and I'll go back to that. Maybe yours is singing songs that glorify God or listening to a certain preacher that reminds you of that day or whatever it is. I mean, you need to go back to Bethel and dwell there. Go back to Bethel and dwell there. Stay where you stay the closest with God. Don't leave it to have to go back to it. Just stay there. God's telling Jacob to get back to Bethel where he appeared to him during a dark time in his life. So verse 1, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Now the next thing is, build for God. You need to go back to Bethel and build for God. When you got saved, you began building your building that you're going to present to Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord wants Jacob to build an altar there. And that's what he's going to do. If you look at verse 6 and 7 in Genesis 35, it says, So Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel. And El Bethel means God of the house of God. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother, which is Esau. So... You need to build for God. How can you get back to building? Well, come to the Lord right now and tell Him you want to be back in fellowship and begin building again. It says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One thing you can say about Jacob is that he is a hard worker. 
God is looking for some hard workers who want to build. And he has already given you the foundation. In 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, it tells you about your foundation. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So you've already got the foundation to build on. And then it says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So you're building your building, right? You're building for God. And you're going to present that building to the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. He's going to put it through the fire, and whatever comes out, if something comes out, you know, you got gold, silver, precious stones coming out, because that's what you've been building with, then that's going to be your reward. But if you've been building with wood, hay, and stubble, it's going to be burned up. Are you building with the right motive? But you need to go back to Bethel, and you need to build for God, or you're going to leave it empty-handed. The next thing is, be clean. A basic instruction before leaving earth, before leaving this earth empty-handed, is being clean. That's just a simple instruction. It says in Genesis 35, 2, Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. So go back to Bethel, build for God, and be clean. If you're going to do anything for God, then it's time you be clean. Here, Jacob's referring to the outside. But what I'm talking about is the inside. You see, in Matthew, 30, or Matthew 23, 27, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchers. The Pharisees were like whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. They were beautiful outwardly, but inside they were a mess. And the Lord Jesus Christ could see that. And then in Matthew seven fifteen it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. They got everything cleaned up on the outside, but inwardly they're wicked. In Psalm 62, 4, it says, They only consult to cast him down from his excellency, they delight in lies, they bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly, Selah. So they say good things outwardly, but they curse inwardly. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You see, every day when you get up, you need to make the decision that you're going to, you're going to focus on living right today. Focus on being clean today, the inside being clean. And then the next day, you focus on being clean that day. A lot of times you think, well, how can I stay away from my pet sins for three months or for a year or for this long? That's the wrong way to think. You need to get up every day and focus on being clean that present day and take it one day at a time. Be clean. Quit cussing, quit gossiping, quit lying, quit backstabbing, quit drinking, quit the drugs, and just quit. I mean, do you realize that most sins that you do are with the mouth? And if you could be just, just be mindful of every time your, your brain tells you to open your mouth. Every time you have something come out of your mouth, or every time you put something in your mouth, think first think is this what I ought to do and that would cut back on most a good percentage of your sins you need to be clean but you've got a dirty mouth Romans three thirteen and 14 says their throat is an open sepulcher their throat with their tongues they have used deceit the poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness look at that the throat the tongue, the lips, and the mouth. Most of the sins in the Bible are sins of the mouth. The Bible says in the book of James, your tongue is set on the fires of hell. I mean, think about it. If you quit 
those things that I mentioned, I mean, would it be a bad thing to quit those things? Anytime I've ever quit a sinful habit, it only worked out for good. I mean, if you quit cussing, your kids probably won't cuss as much. If you quit cussing, you look more professional on the job. If you quit backstabbing and gossiping, you got a lot less drama. If you quit drinking, then you save money. You stay out of trouble, and you stay out of places that you shouldn't be. I mean, not only is it going to affect you spiritually, it's going to affect you in just your day-to-day -day life. Being clean is very is a very underrated thing. So, basic instructions before leaving earth, before leaving this earth empty-handed. Get back to Bethel. Build for God. Be clean. And then the next thing, bury your gods. It says in Genesis 35, 2, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. We know that Rachel had false gods. And the people they took captive from Shechem and Hamor probably had some false gods. But we know uh, Rachel had some in Genesis 31, 30-32. I mean, if you dig down really deep in your heart, you're probably going to find some false gods. You need to take your false gods and bury them. The Bible says in Exodus 20 and verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So here in Genesis, we got having false gods is wrong before the law. In Exodus 20 and verse 3, having false gods is wrong during the law. In Exodus 34, 14, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. He doesn't like you having other gods. In Matthew 4, 10, it says, Then saith Jesus unto him, unto the devil, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then you got in the church time period, the church age, the Apostle Paul saying in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. A basic, simple, a very basic instruction before leaving empty-handed. If you don't want to leave empty-handed, you need to bury your false gods. In Genesis 35, 3, it says, And let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. Jacob isn't getting himself right with the Lord before, in, in other chapters. You can see that he's straight off and messed up so many times. But there was a time in Bethel when he got right with the Lord. And he's going to go back to Bethel. And he's just not getting himself right with the Lord. But also says, let us arise. You need to get your family up out of the dumpster as well. Get them back to their Bethel. Be the one who leads the way and makes there an altar. Look at what that says. And I will make there an altar unto God. So Jacob's going to build an altar there unto God. Notice that phrase, who answered him in the day of his distress. Now, think about your false gods for a minute. When is the last time that they answered you? Does your car, your job, your video game, or any of those things talk back or answer you? You probably had a boyfriend at one time that was your idol that probably didn't even answer the phone. But Jacob had a God that answered him. And in Genesis 35, 4, it says, And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. So they had handheld gods. They gave all the strange gods which were in their hand. That's just like men today. They carry around their god in their hand, an iPhone, an iPad, a Nintendo DS, things like that. A lot of these things can be used for good. For example, I type out a lot of my, my, my outlines on my iPhone. And then I upload them to my laptop so that I can keep them to pass on to somebody else. I mean, these lessons themselves, right now I'm using the iPhone to record it. While I'm multitasking, you know, waiting to pick up my daughter from school, I, I record these. Or in the morning before I go into work. You know, these things are good tools, multitasking, uh, multitasking tools. But at the same time, they can become little handheld gods. 
So they gave to Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand. These things can be used for good, but they can also become a god. And they even got rid of their earrings. And I don't believe this means that earrings are sinful in and of themselves. But maybe they were getting so materialistic that their possessions were acting as their gods. They could have possibly, possibly seen the earrings as a temptation to make false gods out of those earrings. And that's exactly what happened in Exodus 32 and verse 2. When Moses is gone, temporarily gone, Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And Aaron made the golden calf out of those earrings. So if a man wants to be a slave forever as well in the Bible, they bore his ear through with something. In Exodus 21, 6, it says, Then his master shall bring unto him, shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. So you had people making false gods out of earrings, and it was also a sign of slavery. And the slavery wasn't a bad thing because the man's doing this so that he can stay with his wife and his kids and because he loves his master. But at the same time, Israel ditching the earrings could be a picture of the saint yielding to the spirit and being set free from being a slave to sin. Since putting something through the ear was a sign of slavery, uh, Israel getting rid of the ear uh, earrings could be a sign of them being set free from serving sin, serving those strange gods. The earrings could have represented the bondage to the gods because sometimes earrings represented bondage in the Bible. For example, the Ishmaelites wore earrings. And what is Ishmael? Uh, he, he pictures the flesh. He pictures being in bondage to the flesh. In Judges 8.24, it says, And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that you would give me every man hit the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites. At the same time, I don't think it's wrong to wear earrings, as long as it doesn't become who you are. I mean, you don't want the material possessions like earrings and your clothes and your cars and your money and your houses to define who you are. So it says in 1 Timothy 2, 9, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. You know, you don't want that you don't want the those type of things to define and make and become who you are. Then it's your God. And I, and I think it's a little weird for men to wear earrings. But I guess in some cultures it's not a weird thing for men to wear earrings. But around here, you know, in a Bible believing crowd or circle, if you come in with as a man with earrings on, you know, it's a little bit weird, I guess. But the Lord talks about putting earrings on his bride, Israel, in the Old Testament in Ezekiel sixteen twelve, and I will put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. And also in Genesis twenty four forty seven, Abraham's servant put an earring on Rachel. Earrings don't seem to be a bad thing in the Bible at all, unless you make them a god. Or use them to make a god, as they did in Exodus 32. But it's just like everything else. Not everything is bad, but it, you can make it bad. For Israel, it represented them decking themselves up and going after their false gods in the Bible. Many times you see that, like in Hosea 2.13. It says, And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forgot me, saith the Lord. So they put on their earrings and all these jewels and got all dolled up for their false gods, their lovers, and went out and committed spiritual adultery. So, I mean, the earrings were many times leading them to bad things. Or was a part of them going after the, the bad things that they did. 
You know, it's kind of like how a woman will look like death at home for her husband, but then she'll dress up like a hooker to go to work, when it should be the other way around. If you're going to dress up nice or don't have on hardly any clothes at all, then let that be how you dress for your husband at home and not for everybody else's husband at work. You see, you come home and you uh, you look horrible for your husband, and then m many times you get up in the morning and you dress up so nice or don't hardly dress up in anything for all the other women's husband at work. Think about it. Do you want all these other women to barely having any clothes on around your husband? It just goes back to being treated how you want to be treated. Treat people how you want to be treated. You don't want all these other women dressing in an immodest way around your husband, so you shouldn't dress that way in front of their husband or, go, or going after everybody else's husband. That's why it says in the Bible so many times, like in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, and let every woman have her own husband. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. In Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Ephesians 5.24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Colossians 3.18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit unto the Lord. Titus 2.5, To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. 1 Peter 3, 1, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. 1 Peter 3, 5, For after this man in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. For a lot of women... Just reading these verses out loud feels like they're taking right hooks and left jabs and uppercuts and sleeper holds to their body. I mean, uh, it's hard verses for some women. But the fact that there are so many verses like this should show even the most shallow Bible reader that Joyce Meyer and Paula White and Beth Moore are some of the biggest Bible dummies ever on the planet. I mean, how could you claim to be a preacher as a woman or a pastor as a woman and overlook all these verses? If they are the pastors, they would be leading their husbands. Now, that's backwards. I mean, if, if a woman's the pastor of a church, she's a pastor over her husband, she's leading her husband in spiritual things. Now, that's backwards. That's messing with the pictures messing with the type you know the husband and wife pictures jesus christ and his bride if the if the wife is having to teach the husband all the spiritual things that's like the bride teaching jesus christ and it works both ways it's not just the woman most times the husband's too much of an idiot to learn any bible so that he can teach his wife but those earrings in their ears could also represent how maybe you have something in your ears that's keeping you from being able to hear. Maybe your thinking is clogged up by your gods. But the next significant thing is where they buried those earrings and those gods. They buried it under an oak. Now this can picture you uh, bringing your sins and putting them at the cross. And 1 Peter 2.24 says... Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. So the tree, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Let's look at some verses that mention the oak tree. Well, you've got Jacob putting the strange gods under the oak. You have Joshua setting up a great stone under an oak in Joshua twenty four twenty six and that's significant because Jesus Christ is called the stone of stumbling that hung for us on the tree. And in 2 Samuel 18.10, Absalom was a sinful, prideful man who was also a type of the Antichrist, and he got his hair hung in an oak on, on the oak tree. And you know what happened? Joab shot three darts through his heart. 
Absalom pictures the Antichrist, the man of sin. Now think about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took the sin of all man, all mankind, and hung on a tree himself. He took three nails, took it compared to Absalom's three darts. Now that's pretty significant. In 1 Kings 13, 14, the young man of God is eating under an oak right before he goes to disobey the Lord. Maybe he should have just stayed under the oak. In Isaiah 129, it talks about the oaks the people desired in use for their idolatry because you know they made these, these groves. They got under the shadow of the trees where it was dark and worshiped their idols there. In Ezekiel 6.13, it talks about the people offering sweet savor to their idols under the thick oaks. And you have more of the same in Hosea 4.13. 4, and in Amos 2.9, the Amorites have the height of cedars and are strong as the oaks. The Amor Amorites, enemies of God's people. Uh, it seems to me that the oaks are associated with idolatry, associated with sinful things, negative things. And most likely, the tree that the cross was made out of was an oak. I mean, it would make a lot of sense because when Jesus Christ was on the cross, what happened to him? He became sin for us. He became the serpent on a pole. So it would make sense that the cross itself would be made of a tree that's associated with sin, idolatry, negative things throughout the Scripture just as Jesus Christ had to become all that sin and negative things on the cross for us to pay for them. And Isaiah 2.13, very interesting here, talks about the oaks of Bashan, Bashan, Bashan. And in the crucifixion psalm, David prophetically speaking, prophetically speaking words about the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross says in Psalm 22, 12, many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round about. Picturing the unclean spirits uh, trying to contend with Jesus while he's on the cross, a spiritual battle was going on. So uh, Isaiah 2, 13 talks about the oaks of Bashan. Psalm 22, 12 talks about the strong bulls of Bashan that, that, uh, beset the Lord Jesus Christ round about while he's on the cross. I think there's something there with all this stuff. The oak tree just has just really jumped out at me through these years of Bible reading and studying the Bible, and I think there's something to that. But back to these strange gods, I mean, anything can become a god. The next time you feel like you have a god, a false god, go outside, look up at the stars, at the sky, and ask yourself if your new false god could make any of that stuff you see in the sky. And they'll always be pale in comparison to the Lord. And with a God that powerful, who could make all those things that you look up and see in the sky, you should realize you need to be working and living for Him. Uh, like when I'm, if I, I'm rarely ever out at dark, but any time that I get, the, like if I'm arriving home, I get the kids out of the car, I get my son out of his car seat. I always have him look up at the sky. And he can barely talk. He's just two. He's not talking that good. But I always have him look up at the sky and I say stars. And he says sta or something like that. Or I say moon. And he says moon or something like that. I'm pointing out to him stuff that's in the sky so that he can realize there's something much bigger than him out there. One day he's going to look up and he's going to realize, you know, something a lot bigger than me made all this stuff. Or if it's during the day, I have him look up and I have him say clouds or sun. And it's just making him realize there's something out there and not so focused on just the everyday stuff. What you're just directly looking at, the cars and the buildings and the the stuff that we're so consumed with. You know, if you just go out and look up, you realize there's an almighty God that made all this stuff. But if you're going to leave this world with something to present to Jesus Christ, here's another basic instruction before you leave this world empty-handed. 
you need you can be bold in the Lord. If you figure out you can be bold in the Lord, you're going to start accumulating some stuff to present to the Lord because you're not going to be afraid of man. You're not going to be afraid to stick your neck out there. In Genesis 35, 5, it says, And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So you can be bold yourself because of who you serve. You serve a terrifying God. If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, Jacob thought that since Levi and Simeon slaughtered pretty much a whole village of people in the last chapter, he thought the surrounding people was going to join up and just kill them all, kill Jacob and his family. But the Lord supernaturally caused terror to fall upon all the cities round about them so they wouldn't attack them. The Lord supernaturally took care of Jacob constantly. I mean, he sent him angels. He gave him promises. He caused the inhabitants of the surrounding cities to fear him. There was nothing that should have made Jacob fear man. He should have been as bold as a lion. Like that verse says, the righteous are bold as a lion. But the wicked fleeth when no man pursueth. And in Proverbs 16, 7, it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. So obviously Jacob was doing some things that were pleasing God, going back to Bethel. And Romans eight thirty one says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now Genesis 35, 6, And Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. So this pictures how when you're on your way back, to where you fell in love with the Lord, you take people with you. He took himself and all the people that were with him. And verse 7 says, And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. So this time he names it El Bethel. That is, meaning, God of the house of God. You see, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost, or the house of God today, but God is more important than the house of God. So El Bethel means God of the house of God. And this is where God appeared to Jacob when he fled from Esau. But the next thing, another basic instruction before you leave earth, is realize burials aren't the end. You see, if you brought your family to Bethel with you, in other words, you brought them to the Lord, then burials are no longer an ending. They are simply, I'll see you again soon. You see, Jacob will be burying some people in this chapter, but it's not a forever goodbye. If you read 1 Thessalonians 4, you know that Paul says, it talks about how it's a, something you can comfort one another with these words. He says, wherefore, comfort another, one another with these words, referring to the fact that at the rapture, you know, you're going to see your loved ones again. And in Genesis 35, 8, But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was called Elon Bakuth, which means oak of weeping. So remember how when you go back to Bethel, it's a picture of you going back to the place where you really got right with the Lord. And remember how that oak tree reminds you of the cross. And when you get right with the Lord, you go back to the cross. Deborah was buried under an oak. And for most people, a death of a close, close loved one reminds them of where they're going to spend eternity. You know, if somebody dies close to you, you think, a lot of people think, uh, I'm glad I got it settled or I need to get this settled. Where am I going to go when I die? Where will they spend eternity? Where they spend eternity has to do with what they did with the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified on the cross, shedding His blood, bread, and resurrected. It has to do with what they did with that. Did they believe or did they choose to reject? You see, Deborah being buried under the oak could picture a saint coming to Jesus Christ and putting down the flesh. You see, Deborah was Rebecca's nurse. What Deborah did was gave nour nourishment to Rebecca's earthly needs, her flesh. When you go back to the cross, you forget about your earthly needs. You, you just bury the flesh again and start focusing on the eternal. She buried her nurse under the oak. That could be a picture of you going back to the cross and burying the things that are concerned with your flesh. And you start focusing on the eternal things 
and not so much the temporal things. There's just so many ways that you can look at the things in the Bible that, that make sense. It's a supernatural book. Genesis 35, 9 through 10, And God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padan Aram and blessed him. And God, had set, God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. You see, instead of making a name for yourself, as they tried to back there in Babel in Genesis 11, maybe you should exalt the Lord's name, and then he'll make you a name. You see, Jacob gets his name changed to Israel. See, his first name wasn't very good. It was the supplanter. But Israel is a prince with God. From Jacob came the twelve tribes, and from them came the nation of Israel. And this is why they are called the children of Israel, because they came from Jacob, and Jacob's name's Israel. If you don't want to leave this world empty-handed, you need to remember that burials aren't the end. You don't just have to quit working for God maybe just because you've lost a loved one. Because if that person was saved, you are going to see them again. And that is a good incentive to just keep going. It's not over. You're going to see them again. The next thing is, if you do not want to leave this earth empty-handed, if you don't want to leave this earth with nothing to present to Jesus Christ, then be fruitful. In Genesis 35, 11, And God said unto him, unto Jacob, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So the Lord is giving Jacob the same promise that he gave Abraham and Isaac. They're going to have so many children that they can't even number them. They're going, going to inherit the land. Uh, so for this reason, they need to be fruitful and multiply. And that's what Jacob has done. And as a born-again believer today, you need to be fruitful and multiply, spiritually speaking. When you get s someone saved, you are multiplying. When I was a little kid, I remember watching a, a scary movie called The Gremlins, and any time those little monsters in the movie got water on them, it made more of them. And thinking back on that movie, as a saved, born-again Bible believer, I see how the devil tries to turn it around. He made it to where the bad guys would multiply when they got water on them. But really, the good guys do in the Bible. You see, Jesus Christ has the water that if you drink it, you'll never thirst again, right? And the Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the Bible is likened to water. Uh, you know, he says in Ephesians that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The Bible is likened to water. Receiving the gospel, they say, is as easy as taking a drink of water. So if you want to multiply, then throw the water of the word on people and it won't return void. Be fruitful and multiply. And you will not be empty-handed when you get in front of the Lord. Genesis thirty-five, twelve: In the land which I gave unto, which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee will I give it. To thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So Jacob is getting the promises that his father's got. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil their own. So a drink offering is pouring out the drink, not drinking the drink. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him Bethel. That is, house of God. And this seems like a retelling of what had already taken place several chapters previously. But here are some examples of how Jacob was fruitful and multiplied. Look at all the children he have. He has. In Genesis thirty five sixteen, and they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. So here she's about to have another child. And she's travailing and she's in hard labor. And this goes all the way back to the curse. You remember in Genesis three sixteen, and to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So it's all because of the curse that women have to uh, have painful childbirth. It's all because of the curse that 
men have to get up and eat by the sweat of their face and work hard every day. But the pain of childbirth is so painful that God compares the earth's inhabitants during the tribulation to go through the same kind of pain. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. So the same pain that go, that's going on in the tribulation and at the second, on the re, people who are on the receiving end of Jesus' sharp two-edged sword at the second coming, their pain is comparable to, uh, if not even worse, than a travail upon a woman with child. But for the natural woman, the pain is all worth it, you see. Now, I mean, for a lot of women, it's probably not. But those are unnatural people, uh, women with unnatural affection. For a woman with natural affection, the pain is all worth it. It says in John sixteen twenty one, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. For joy that a man is born into the world. Uh, like my wife says, she would go back and do it all over again, all the pain that she went through, just to have to relive having the kids over again. And I mean, she was uh, trying to have my first one for about 30 hours, and probably almost as much that time the second time around too. But that always reminded me of that verse when she says that. John sixteen twenty one. Now Genesis thirty five seventeen and eighteen. It came to pass when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, for fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father, which is Jacob, called him Benjamin. So Rachel actually dies having Benjamin. And Benoni means the son of my sorrow. That's what Rachel named him. And Jacob calls him Benjamin. And that means the son of my right hand. So Jacob was, by calling him that, was referring to Rachel as his right hand. She was his right hand woman. And we already knew she was his favorite out of all of his wives. But notice it says her soul was in departing. This is significant because a man is made up of three. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So a man has a spirit, a soul, and a body. Rachel's spirit at death would have went to the Lord and the body to the ground. In Ecclesiastes 12.7, it says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the, the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Now listen closely to what I'm saying. Her spirit went to the, with the Lord. Her body went to the ground. But her soul would have went into what's called death or paradise in the heart of the earth at that time. This is because in the Old Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ had not died yet. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ had not been shed yet. So therefore, men couldn't go to the third heaven. You know, like for me and you... To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Like if you died right now as a saved person, you'd get your soul and spirit would go straight to the Lord. But you see, many believe the Lord went ahead and allowed them to go to the third heaven in the Old Testament instead of in the heart of the earth, is what they teach. They don't believe that the saints of the Old Testament went to the heart of the earth. They believe that the Lord went ahead and allowed them to go ahead and go to the third heaven. Because what they believe is that God would have already seen the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross through his foreknowledge, which there's no doubt about it. The Father knew the Son was going to die on the cross for our sins, be buried and resurrected. No doubt about it. He saw that through his foreknowledge. But at the same time, it doesn't seem at all like the Lord would have applied the blood of Christ to all the Old Testament saints before the blood had even been shed. And if he did, what was the point of all the bloody animal sacrifices then? What was that? What was the point of that? You know, if he was already going to go ahead and apply the blood to them, 
then what's the point of the bloody animal sacrifices? Uh, but Rachel's soul would have went to paradise in the heart of the earth until Jesus Christ would have died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried, and resurrected. And this verse also shows us that a person isn't dead until the soul leaves the body. Now verse 19, in Genesis 35, 19, it says, And Rachel died and was buried in the way of Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave, that is the pillar of Rachel's grave, unto this day. So unto this day, that phrase unto this day would be speaking of when Moses wrote Genesis, which took place way later. And Samuel a actually knew the exact location of this grave. In 1 Samuel 10, 2, it says, When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher. That's the, this is the same Rachel he's referring to in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah. Now verse 21. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the tower of Edar. This could be like shepherd's towers. Like in Micah 4, 8, it says, And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. Uh, verse 22, And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. His father is Jacob, and Bilhah is one of Jacob's wives. Reuben went and lay with her. He slept with her, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. It says, But remember Bilhah, the one he just slept with? One of Jacob's lesser wives is Bilhah. Jacob ended up having children by Rachel and Leah's handmaidens, Zilpah and Bilhah. And here, Jacob's son Reuben takes his father's concubine, Bilhah, and lays with her. And a concubine is like a lesser wife, but still, she's still a wife. And this was still considered incest, even though Bilhah wasn't Reuben's mother. It was his father's wife, so it was still considered incest. And just like a man taking, uh, you know, his stepmother would still be considered incest. You see, concubines are still wives. And in Genesis, or Judges 19, 1 through 4, a certain Levite gets a concubine and her father is referred to as his father-in-law, showing you that it's still... Uh, counted as a wife a concubine still counted as a wife and in genesis 30 and verse 4 it even calls bilhah jacob's wife so she's a concubine but it's still his wife and incest that reuben committed was worthy of the death penalty under the law but remember this was before the law so you see reuben was spared for that reason but still he still lost his birthright because of this and remember, Simeon and Levi, his brothers, also lost their birthright in the previous chapter. And in First Chronicles 5 and verse 1, it says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, you know, laying with Bilhah, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. And it says in Genesis 49, 3 through 4, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. But notice what he says about him, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, that then defilest it, defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. So Reuben lost the birthright. He was first in line. Then it would have went to Simeon and Levi, but they lost it as well because they murdered a whole village of people in chapter 34. So they lost the birthright. And look at what it says about them in Genesis 49, 5 through 10. And you'll see why this is very significant here in a minute. In Genesis 49, 5, it says, Simeon and Levi are brethren, instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, Come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor. Be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they dig down a wall. 
Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob, and scatter them in Israel. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stopped down, He stooped down. He, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So the birthright goes to Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. This is significant because Jesus Christ is the line of the tribe of Judah, as it says in Revelation 5.5, 5, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter is what a king has. And all the stuff that went on with Reuben, Simeon, and Levi was just another attack on the seed by the serpent. And then the next verse, Genesis thirty-five twenty-three, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, who lost the birthright, and Simeon and Levi, who lost the birthright, and then it says, and Judah, and Issachar, and Zebulun. This verse was written not only to show you that Jacob was fruitful and multiplied, but to show you who was next in line. It went Reuben, Simeon and Levi, they lost it, and then it went to Judah. Now, Genesis 35, 24 through 26, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher, these are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him, and paid in a ram. So Jacob was fruitful and multiplied. As we will be, as you know, we should be, spiritually speaking, if we don't want to leave this world empty handed, we're going to go around and try to get people born into the family of God. Then Genesis, 20, Genesis 35, 27, and 28. And Jacob came upon unto Isaac his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were a hundred and fourscore years. So Isaac lived to be a hundred and eighty years old, because a score is twenty, so fourscore would be eighty. So a hundred and eighty years old. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered into his people, being old and full of days. You know, when you get you you, you see as a young person right now, you're not ready to die yet, because you've not lived that many days. But there's going to come a time when you get full of days. And you'll be ready to leave this world. You'll be full of days. And his son Esau and Jacob buried him. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his son, sons Esau and Jacob buried him. But remember, the burial doesn't mean it's the end. Jacob would see him again. The burial isn't, doesn't have to be a goodbye forever. It can be a see you again soon.